Ok. Ok. Uh, see, um, I must tell you that I'm basically an engineer. So it's fake. I apply the math a lot. I have to apply because engineering is all about the uh, applications of mathematics and stuff. But uh, I was actually an electronic engineer and uh, probably till my masters, uh, I was not quite aware that, you know, I could do something in math. I had some interesting uh, you know, time during my masters, we were I think some seminars and stuff, for which I had to dig uh, deeper into the math aspects of number theory and stuff. So I self learned that so I was able to, you know, appreciate the beauty of math. Then I was also working for a company where I had to do a lot of interesting stuff on cryptography. It was again self taught for me. So which had a lot of math again. So these things combined with, you know, my PhD times, you know, I was mentored by some of the best professors, I must say, uh, especially Professor Ritan Rao, who was like a complete influence on me, like in terms of mathematics and things. So uh, I think these things shaped me up like at one point of time, I actually ditched electronics engineering in total. I started teaching only math courses like, you know, linear algebra, number theory, uh, statistics, stochastic modeling and a lot of stuff because I found this was interesting. And second thing is like, uh, you know, because of mentoring that I've had and the background that I come from, it was also uh, interesting and easy for me to, you know, connect uh, concepts that are there. You know, I do math. I'm also able to connect to the concepts that I learned in engineering. So I found that this is something which is of more interest to me. And uh, of course, as I said, like uh, professors, you know, have their impact for eternity. You know, uh, there are two, three of them who have, you know, completely uh, had that impact even till now and probably really beyond. So that's how I developed interest in math. And now, whatever, uh, uh, what would I call the uh, fun uh, learning math that I had and whatever interesting ideas that I could get, I just wanted to give, talk to students and then make them realize that these things are simple and you would also start loving math. I and mean, for an engineer oh, who never wanted to do math to somebody who only does, there's a huge transition that I've had. I think if I could enjoy what I'm doing, I should be spreading that to my students. So that's how I, my math, my background, everything happened. So it's the, now the emphasis being on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, almost everybody does that. But the point is like, as Professor Gilbert Strang from MIT mentions, you know, there are some three different domains of mathematics, which every AI ML engineer must know. One is linear algebra, one is probability and statistics, and the other one is calculus and optimization. Of course, coding comes later, but then your value add to any place or to any company or to, to any team that you're a part of comes from the stronghold that you have in any of these domains. I mean, if you, if you, you could be a coding engineer, there's nothing wrong about it, but the point is like, uh, I mean, you have to be inevitable uh, to a company when you work there. I mean, uh, you should be, uh, I mean, you should actually be a pivot point in a company. I mean, that comes out when you do have your math foundations and your whole of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's all about applying linear algebra. And since you do a lot of predictions and other things, it's all about probability. And so you look at modern security systems that you have, like with which you do transactions and stuff. I think cryptography involves deep number theory ideas. So I think, uh, uh, you have a lot of interesting uh, contemporary domains that are based on all these things. I think I actually think that these are very important and uh, anybody who wishes to pursue their career in these domains you must have their own strong foundation in these. So it, 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 these domains are there to stay. See, for uh, I mean, when you uh, when you say like indigenous knowledge, like I, I assume that like you're talking about the knowledge system that is there in this country, and what what. If you actually see that uh, our the only problem that uh, our country seems to have had in terms of preserving its knowledge system is basically uh, they were not documented. We go through this what we call as karna parampara. So it was like by word of mouth. Uh, tutoring, mentoring, and all that sort of what was happening. And so we've probably lost a lot of uh, interesting ideas. 
which uh, you know which could include even our uh, ideas of calculus, idea of Pythagoras theorem, meant a whole lot of things. Uh, so when you go back and then see, like there are you know you you would see you know, some of these old mathematicians like you have in fact in Kerala you seem to have had this nice school of mathematics, Madhava school of mathematics and stuff where they've done quite a few interesting things on calculus which we feel that you know uh, if, if you are able to uh, get back some courses or probably some emphasis on Indian knowledge system I think we will be able to know how rich we were and how advanced we were compared to the western thinking that uh, you, probably some of these names have gone to the you know, Western side, like, which has been completely hidden from us. We had a lot of calculus ideas, we had a lot of number theoretic ideas, we had, uh, in fact, what we call as uh, um, Bell's equation or something in number theory. And you have so the equivalent here, Brahmagupta, so this one is there. So you have uh, equations which have been done here where people have given solutions to all that. I think uh, we should probably be even looking at, uh, you know, the link between the Western system, like how did they get these ideas? From where did they get these ideas? I mean, when they had come for trading or something, they would have probably even got these ideas and got gone back. So I think uh, it's high time we start focusing on our Indian knowledge system. I think the government is also trying to do something. And if you look at Tier 3 institutes, among which you have, you know, certain branded universities and stuff. Those are kids which could have actually gone to Tier 2 universities, but then they fell short by a few ranks, and then again, they have that uh, fire in them. I think our academic system must, uh, you know, change from the conventional uh, exam mark system to, you know, improve or, or to in, uh, inculcate ideas of creativity and stuff like so. Even in math, there's no point in like, you know, just giving a formula based question and asking them to solve plug numbers and then give, but instead make them ask questions or you ask them questions. And then uh, my thing is like, pro I feel some of these institutes can probably take lead in forming some kind of a mathematics circle, study circle or something. Where you bring in students who are from tier three institute who are still interested in math. Come to these places and then probably, you know, discuss, you, you create a platform where they get to interact with some of the best brains. I think that's going to help you build uh, some kind of interest in math and science. In fact, we were actually planning to do a mathematics study circle. We, uh, me and my students were actually planning saying, look, why don't we start this? Uh, with my professors, you know, some of my professors from IASE, they were also willing to support us. You get the students here, we will talk to them. I think uh, such kind of, uh, you know, activities like math study circle, I think that will help people to kind of uh, develop interests. They'll also know what's happening in tier one institutes. They'll also know what is happening in tier two institutes. I think if you can connect these two, I'm quite sure there is going to be a, a wonderful uh, network that's going to be built among people. It's not that tier one students are going to throw out the tier three students like, look, you don't use a match or this one or tier three students are going to feel insecure talking to them because you know you're from that institute I'm scared to talk to you know there's nothing like that I mean, we've all exper experimented this where you connect some students from you know IAC to some students in you know tier 3 colleges see how it works it builds a beautiful network learning will automatically happen I think you, we should start fostering uh, you know such kind of activities you should start to you know, act activities where you have math studies or science studies or put these minds and then have like regular events uh, that would definitely help Definitely. This mentoring will help with the sense, uh, see many times students don't want to approach their professors and then ask. But when it is somebody who is of their age group, they are able to relate to that. So this would definitely work. Some kind of a, a peer mentoring or a peer, uh, you know, peer group which will help them discuss and stuff. I think that's going to help you a lot. Good. I mean, I feel that there's going to be a lot of uh, bio-based, uh, you know, domains that could come, like a lot of things already are happening in climate and other things. Bio could be another one, because I see now, like, uh, medical practitioners are getting into AI and ML, which means these are the ones who probably, you know, had a second thought of doing mathematics in high school and then they wanted to do biology and stuff. Now they are getting back to bio mathematics to say, look, we want to learn, which means unless 
uh, you are competent enough, you know, in these domains of math and, you know, of course, you have to pick some coding skills. It's going to be very difficult. You can't just be saying, I am going to do only this and I'm not going to look into other things because when they, uh, the, you know, the tentacles that AI and ML is like spreading, it's like a uh, phenomenon. You just have almost every domain to include AML, including linguistics, you go linguistics, you look at archaeology, you look at, uh, you know, forensics. You have almost everywhere the influence of AI and ML is seen. So you must be very, very, very strong, I feel, in math. And then probably you must have some domain knowledge. If you say that I want to get into, let's say, agri, I must know what's happening in agriculture, then how do I apply AI and ML to it? Of course, you must have skills like coding. You, the coding is something which you cannot say, I won't do it. Till maybe 20 years back, you could say this. But right now, you can't say, I will not do coding. Or I will just do coding, I will ignore the other one. So I think some strong math skills and some strong coding skills and some strong domain skills and domain knowledge, I think that will help you would definitely propel faster. I think uh, students are genuinely capable of doing things and uh, they are hyper interested, hyper curious, whatever you call, they are there, but it's just that maybe our system no, doesn't give them that, uh, uh, you know, the freedom to uh, think about or being creative. It's like uh, every university works within its boundary of, you know, completing the syllabus, conducting tests and stuff. So they, I mean, you could say that they have other activities where they can get uh, creative and things, but uh, academic creativity is what is going to be rewarding for them. And when you don't uh, allow that, it becomes a problem. But as such, I feel, uh, you know, our students are like, their talent is like amazing. I mean, uh, and uh, they are quite capable of doing a lot of things. All that it requires is like probably a nudge some and say, look, why you, you can't do, can you not do this? If you can't do this, there's nobody who can do this. Why don't you try it out? Just requires some nudge. I'm quite sure uh, our guys will do much, much better.